enormous uh, honor to be here, to have gotten to know people at Macquarie, uh, to, to work uh, already closely with uh, David Christian and, and others. Um, and I, I think the <clears throat> importance of big history for the uh, Anthropocene, for the future prospects of life on Earth, uh, couldn't be overestimated. And I'm going to try to show there's a very powerful lever in, <clears throat> in revising uh, university curricula and how humans uh, think about ourselves and our relationship to our planet and the rest of the universe. Um, my piece speech is a little bit complicated, so I want to just start with a quick analogy, um, <clears throat> which explains a lot of it. it there's a, a movie, a um, pretty old one now, called The Magic Christian with, uh, uh, with uh, Peter Sellers. He plays the richest man in the world in the movie, and um, <clears throat> all of his, uh, the, he's having a meeting of his board on a moving train. I think it's in Yorkshire um, or someplace like that. And um, all his uh, um, boards of directors are, are reporting declines in public confidence, sales, and so forth. So he says, uh, gentlemen, you're all fired. They're all men, of course. And um, the uh, train stops. He gets off first. And then his board members get off. And each of them, he hands each of them a map, but no map of Yorkshire, right? So the maps of Cincinnati, Ohio, right? Or, or Auckland, New Zealand, um, or you know uh, Canberra, but but no maps of uh, where they are, and, and I think um, that's a good metaphor for higher education, right? If you um, you know when when you uh, walk across the stage and somebody puts a piece of paper in your hand, um, you know you should think pretty carefully about whether it's a map of where you are, because I think in many cases it's not a map of anything. Um, so um, it, anyway, I'm going to be pretty hard on higher ed. I think it deserves it, um, and uh, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> So this is just a quick uh, over, I want to thank John Erickson, by the way, for helping me to make this uh, <coughs> presentation, I, I hope, crystal clear. Um, so um, we're uh, embedded in narratives um, that mistake who we are, where we came from, and where we might be headed. Uh, there are two competing worldviews that set up a, a dynamic in higher ed that's very, very unfortunate. Um, as a result, higher ed not only has helped to create the Anthropocene, but is blocking responses uh, to it. And then I want to finish uh, with uh, what higher education could do uh, for the Anthropocene and then with some um, somewhat speculative uh, views about the re relationship of uh, the role of, of ethics and, and religious experience in extracting ourselves from the big mess we've created. So um, there are two basic uh, narratives that are at play in, in our culture, um, and, uh, but often uh, pretty buried from sight. Um, the, um, we, we live by narrative because we need some story to locate ourselves relative to the biophysical universe, to locate to others and other cultures and so forth. Um, and for, uh, if we say we're 200,000 uh, years old as a species, for uh, most of that time the, the, uh, the con controlling narratives have come, been supplied by religions. But in the 17th century and, and since then, there's a competing na uh, master narrative, the narrative of science, of which we've heard um, many, many just brilliant presentations in, in this conference. Um, so th these are kind of in, in competition with each other. Um, and so I'm going to talk first about uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview, and then uh, second about the um, um, newer scientific worldview that's, that's competing with it. And, uh, but one of my points is that much of what we do in, in um, practice and what we do in universities is still entangled with um, the na narrative number one. So uh, this is what uh, we've come to call the Emancipation Project, and the idea that humans are, are the superior creature on Earth, that it's possible for us to um, emancipate ourselves from nature. Um, agriculture is a good example of that. We, um, we emancipate ourselves from others by, by thinking of other people on the planet and other species on the planet as less worthy than we are. Um, and then we also manipulate ourselves in order to fulfill uh, dubious social goals such as, uh, such as economic growth. So we think of ourselves as consumers rather than citizens. There are other factors that have led to the Anthropocene. I'm not going to go into those. I just want, to, want people to be aware that I'm, I'm not claiming it's all a history of ideas project. It's, it's, there's a lots of, sort of from a Marxian point of view, lots of material sources uh, for, the, for the present uh, unfolding disaster. Um, and um, I want to make the argument that um, comes really from Carolyn Merchant's work that, this, um, that the current era is, in, is um, in the thinking in the current era is embedded in a failed master narrative. Um, this is a um, photograph of the cover of her book uh, called um, Reinventing Eden, The Fate of Nature in Western Culture. 
a brilliant piece of, of cultural uh, history, I think. Um, and the, um, the, the main idea is, is really, really pretty simple. It's that uh, humans, uh, in, in the Western narrative, we feel that we've been expelled from paradise. And so the project of Western culture is to retake our place, our rightful place uh, on the earth. And, and here's a picture of, um, of a lot of this uh, story into this one thing. I happen to see this in the National Gallery of Canada. Um, so, oh, it's just on, exhibit, uh, on a visit there. Um, so everybody can tell uh, more or less what this is. This is um, God creating a man in his image. It's on the left. And God creating woman from Adam's rib. And then... Um, on the extreme right, Adam um, receiving the apple. Of course, it wasn't in that period of time, but it's this is how the Italians thought about it. From Eve, and that, of course, uh, brought down the whole show, and it's all women's fault, and, you know, so, I mean, we could stop there, right? Um, now, if, if you notice, um, Eve has two heads, and the, uh, the second head, the one on the right, is connected uh, to the body of a snake. So um, if you want to know where uh, the patriarchal um, images and uh, justifications come from, it goes back a long way. And, and of course, uh, due to um, failure to obey God's command not to eat of the fruits of the tree of knowledge, human beings are expelled from paradise. And this is Thomas Cole's uh, depiction of Acts painted around 1820, I guess, uh, where on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the former paradise was beautifully lit warm, uh, water, uh, abundant food, and so forth. And we've been cast out into a, a really uh, degraded uh, and, and very, very hostile environment where what we could get for free before, we have, to, we have to work very hard. And in the Genesis story, if you recall, it's not only that human beings have fallen, it's that the whole of nature has fallen too. Na nature has been become a degraded state of affairs. That's very important in the way this narrative plays out. Um, so in this, um, in this story, everybody knows already that, that God uh, creates us in his image. And, uh, but <clears throat> another part of the story is that he gives uh, the world, the, the earth, uh, to, to men and the sons of men. It's um, quite explicitly uh, masculinely oriented. Um, and this plays a very important role for our culture and, and I think for uh, the sorry state of affairs in the landscapes of, of most of the continents um, at, at this time, which I'll come, I'll come back to. Um, so in this, in this story, uh, there's, um, uh, in the, by the Middle Ages, people came up with the idea, well, as a way to think about this uh, in terms of the value of things from a, from a moral point of view. Um, so God is at the top, and, and the, the, um, the angels and the demons are, um, are in the realm of being, and, the, uh, and then there's the realm of becoming, which is where we're sort of at the border between those two. And then there's the other animals, the plants, minerals, and then at the bottom, there's rocks. I've looked at this with great care with the magnifying glass. I can't find any McGill professors anywhere on that. So, uh, you know, I think maybe we just got left out. Um, so in this, in this narrative, um, the, um, this is a very famous quote from Francis Bacon. Um, where he's talking about how we might retake our rightful place on Earth. Um, and uh, the, the, the basic, basic notion is that through, the through knowledge and the application of technology, we can restore an earthly, earthly paradise from which we have been, unfortunately, unjustly ejected. And then Carolyn's argument is that uh, the rise of capitalism and technology in the 18th and 19th centuries um, in the 20th century, of course, uh, make possible uh, this uh, vision of a, of a planetary transformation, which is, of course, what, what we're now doing. Um, so, so with uh, thanks to Klaus, um, you know, we have a pretty uh, similar diagnosis of where the, the European story sort of went off the tracks. Um, my, mine is on the, on the left, uh, Klaus is on the right. Um, I didn't get mine to work out quite so neatly in terms of a word. Uh, but, uh, so, so we're the chosen species, we're the chosen people. Uh, we are exercise our dominion over the rest of the earth through empire, colonialism, uh, the development project of the post-World War II period, free trade. And, and more recently, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is uh, ominously hanging over uh, our heads and necks, 
uh, where, where we, meaning Canada and the other countries that might be signatories to this, will be giving up a lot of what Klaus called good sovereignty, right? Ability to control our own environmental destiny would be, would be very substantially weakened if this is ratified. So here, here's one of the more amazing um, confessions, I think, of, of what we're up to uh, that you'll, you'll find. Um, so this is uh, the title of this uh, painting is American Progress. Um, and on the right-hand side of the painting, you can see the lights coming in. That's from Europe. You can see the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and, the, uh, and to the left-hand side is darkness. And the, the woman looks, who's, looks like the Statue of Liberty in lots of ways. is carrying a book. You can't tell whether it's a Bible or a law book. And, and she's bringing technology along with her in the form of uh, trains and probably telegraph wire. And the job of progress is to get rid of the aboriginal people and to get rid of other species and to turn the central part of what's now the United States into an agricultural um, behemoth, basically, to, to, be a, to, to have a monstrous uh, agricultural capacity, which, of course, uh, the United States has or, will, or it may be declining due to um, overpumping the aquifers and things like that. But anyway, uh, in that era, it was thought of as a, as a great, great triumph. And, and so I think if you look, you take her narrative and you say, well, has this worked or not? I, I think it has worked. You know, we've basically uh, been able, tried to recreate paradise and uh, we've succeeded. This is um, the, um, anybody know where this is? West Edmonton Mall near Edmont, near, uh, on <clears throat> in Alberta, an extremely cold place a lot of the year. Um, and I think if you want to think about this as the Garden of Eden, then here it is. It's palm trees, it's nice and warm, plentiful water, and you can get uh, Diet Coke and, and uh, potato chips anytime you want, right? So this is really is paradise, you know? This has just been, uh, it took a couple thousand years, but we, uh, we managed to pull it off. So, so this is um, how, how this, this um, tradition helps to um, make, a, make the mess is, what one is it, it locates uh, the sacred principally, not entirely, uh, in the transcendent. I, I think the first lines of the Lord's Prayer are very, um, are very instructive. Our Father who art in heaven. Um, he's not here, right? Some other place. Um, and um, in, um, I'll come back to this a little, a little later, but George Santayana says that, well, we really should think of religious piety as respect toward the material sources of our being, right? So, so we want, once you make this separation, the dualism that De Klaus was talking about, very, very important. Um, the um, Army Corps of Engineers in the United States, is, I, we tried to look up whether you have something exactly the same here and couldn't find it, but you likely do, is in, the, is in the business of reclaiming the earth, right? Of filling in swamps, right? Of straightening rivers, you know, basically um, making the earth um, commodious for man. Right, for humans, um, and that's had a, a long and, and a huge impact on, on the landscape of the United States. From an ecological integrity point of view, almost none of that could be thought of as positive. Um, and, um, and then uh, in this tradition also, the human-Earth relationship is taught, uh, thought of as property. Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit. And since uh, 1961, <coughs> excuse me, and the emergence of the growth imperative in macroeconomic policy, uh, this has really been a rampage. And, and some of the uh, slides in uh, Will Steffen's talk yesterday really showed that. I mean, the amazing amount of junk that's been created since, since 1950 uh, is just, just phenomenal. Um, so um, everybody knows this. We're overrunning Earth's life support systems. Uh, it's into a very, very dangerous period. Uh, and we're losing um, the commonwealth of life, right? We're, we're, um, this is just a summary of the species, uh, the decline within species, right? Not a decline of species. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's um, an amazing, and if you care about, uh, if you're Leopoldian and you, and you, you have an uh, ecological conscience, um, Leopold says you live in a world of wounds. Um, and it's very hard uh, to um, avoid that feeling a lot of the time. Uh, nowadays. So we also have, of course, enormous uh, population. Um, the United States is now the third largest uh, country in, in the world in terms of population. So it's, it's China, India, United States, Indonesia. Uh, the United States is headed for a population of around uh, 340 million 
by the middle of the century, uh, every one of them a sweetheart. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a big place and getting bigger. Um, and, of course, there's very rapid population growth predicted by the UN, a, a very, very unfortunate thing I'll come back to toward the end. So world view number two um, is um, basically to take the evolutionary, the cosmic evolutionary paradigm, uh, shift the understanding of the... Um, of the person uh, as a more a member of a community and to see what that, uh, where that leads us. Now, of course, a lot of this was covered by David in the opening talk, uh, so I'm not going to even dare compete with that. I'm just going to hit a couple of the highlights here in case you didn't, you didn't hear that. So, so anyway, we're a part of the universe. That's not a surprise to anybody except economists, right, who, who don't, don't realize that we're a part of the universe and that, that the economy has to obey the laws of, of the govern the rest of the universe. So I don't have to spend much time on that. Then, you know, there is this notion in, in current cosmology that the, uni that the universe is in a constantly creative process. Um, and this is a, just a NASA picture called the Pillars of Creation. Um, there's sort of a continuous birthing of new stars um, and so forth. Um, so this is, um, this is, the, this is, see, this is the medieval picture. So the medieval picture had it backwards, right? So it isn't that the mind preceded the universe, the, universe, the mind came from the universe, right? So, so it, as uh, Deschardins said, that mind is implicit in the universe from the beginning. So, um, the, uh, so rocks are more fundamental than mind looked at, looked at this way, or, or precede mind in, uh, in, in um, the order of, of, of being in terms of time. So look, looked at this way, um, it is going back again to what uh, David was talking about, the universe is basically in a vast process of cooling itself off, right? It's using the, the gradients to complete, to, to, to uh, create sort of steps of complexity. Um, so the universe is getting simpler and more complex at the same time. Um, and um, mind is an emergent property of, of this complexifying process. And um, look, looked at this way, the, um, it's important to realize that mind is, is very um, ubiquitous um, on Earth, and whether it's ubiquitous on other planets, we don't know, but um, other, other uh, creatures have minds. Um, the um, friend of mine, uh, Jack Mano, who works with the Haudenosaunee near Syracuse, New York, uh, told me that when the, um, when, <coughs> when the Mohawks figured out the Europeans were idiots, was, was when they said they were going to take a walk in the woods to be alone, right? Um, the, um, <laughs> right? Because um, the, you know, there's signals everywhere. If you, if you revise your conception of what it, what it is to have a sort of language, if you like, it's ubiquitous and th things are signaling all, 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 all the time. And this is a quote, it's probably a little hard to read, uh, but, but um, it's just a homage. This is from uh, Outermost House by Henry Beston. And just maybe I'll read the um, very last uh, little uh, paragraph there. In a world order and more older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with extension of the senses we have lost or never attained. Living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. Um, so I think this point of view requires a kind of com pretty complete revision of sort of how we fit into the whole uh, thing. Um, and uh, just a couple more, just more very quick summaries from this story is the Earth then is an island of complexity in an entropic universe. It's not the probably not the only one. Uh, in fact, we know it isn't the only one. And living organisms are encoded dissipative structures. This comes from Prigogine, uh, which handle the massive amounts of sunlight that continuously arises. And... Um, this will go, go back to some of what Michael was talking about yesterday. Um, there's no such thing uh, as an individual um, except perhaps the universe itself. Right? Everything else is relational. There might be another universe to which our universe is connected. We don't know and we don't, haven't found any way to try to test that. So this, I think, is one of the more important slides of this presentation because if you're going to substitute the big history narrative or one like it for the Judeo-Christian narrative, you have a lot less to work with uh, in terms of how you think about yourselves and ourselves and the institutions, or at least a lot of what we've been accustomed to using to build the narrative of ourselves and to ground our institutions uh, gets get ruled out, right, or is not part of the story. It's not necessarily directly refuted. It's just not there anymore. 
So, um, so we've already talked about the fact that life may be quite common in the universe. Uh, we don't know that, of course, but it seems at least possible and perhaps plausible. Uh, there's no chosen species in the evolutionary narrative. And um, there's no reason to think that more people is, a, is necessarily a good, right? It's, it's only, it depend, more people depends on the circumstances at the time, right? In some times it's better to have more people and sometimes it's better to have less, a lot less. This is one of the times it's better to have a lot less. Um, so um, um, there's no divine mandate to humans own the earth, right? Because there's no gift from God to humans. Um, there's no, there's a unity of mind and body, uh, so there's no personal immortality, right? When the body dies, we're gone, basically. Um, and there's no virgin birth, right, either, right? It's not part of the biological narrative. Um, there's no exogenous rescue. No, there's nobody who's going to come and save us from all the mess we've made. Sometimes right around this time of year, I think there must be somebody like that, right? Uh, because it's so otherwise sort of grim, you know, uh, but anyway, by about the 27th or 28th of December, I figure out, well, no, it's not going to happen, you know, it's have to sort of uh, keep going the best we can. Um, and, and there's a gr great poem, uh, the Advent poem by W.H. Auden uh, on called Alone, Alone, right? If anybody knows that poem, it's sort of like, well, what, are, what would it be to really realize we were alone? Right, or we were without, we were without any sort of divine mandate. It's a really great poem to take a look at this time of year. It's not an upper, though. Um, and then there's uh, no uh, ex cathedra moral systems, right? There's no, there are no systems that are delivered independent of the evolutionary system, uh, of the evolutionary narrative, right? It, it, the, whatever moral s narratives we're going to come up with, we're going to have to build them up out of the evolutionary narrative, not, not build them from... Um, from the, some uh, divine uh, or sacred ex exogenous presence. And then in this um, narrative, the sort of uh, the whole notion that women are the big problem and everything and so forth just gets wiped out. Um, and women are not in any way inferior to men or are they the men's property and so forth. So it's really a lot of what, how we think uh, goes out the window here. Um, so uh, now I wanna switch back to uh, higher education and how it's helped to um, create and help to block, uh, create the Anthropocene and help to block responses to it. Um, so we came up with this idea, um, not everybody likes this metaphor, including one of the students of the program was sitting in the front row, but anyway, I think it's a great one, um, that we came up with the idea that there are certain disciplines that are orphans, right? Um, and um, where these disciplines are, are principally in the social sciences or the professions. Um, and so I just want to try to develop that idea a little bit and, and defend it. So in, in, uh, in higher ed, um, since we're not giving our students maps of where they are, we're helping to set them up for a uh, failure, for a collective and individual failure. Um, and um, this is what it means to be a, a human orphan. Or a human orphan is someone whose parents have died. Um, and, uh, but he, he or she hasn't, and a, a dis an orphan discipline is a discipline whose parents have died, whose metaphysical and scientific parents have died, but he um, or it, the discipline, is still alive in pedagogy and practice. So I'm going to talk about just what some of those are in a minute. Um, kind of it's a little bit hard to say exa exactly where the boundary of the idea of uh, orphans is, but it's um, certainly uh, the ones that we've concentrated on are the ones that are explicitly normative. Um, economics, finance, law, governance, ethics, and religion. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about religion except at the very end, just for a couple of minutes, but I will talk a little bit about each of, each of the others and, and how these are, are very misleading uh, ways of, of thinking. Um, so here, here is what, what I think it means to adopt an orphan, uh, an orphan discipline. One, one is you have to rebuild the discipline in a way that's consistent with ontology, right? With the, with, has to be consistent with the way the universe works, right? Um, it has, so that's where big history plays a big role, right? Because big history is an interpretation of how the universe works, right? So we ought to make sure that, our, that somehow our disciplines, unless we reject big history, somehow or other are compatible with the big history narrative. Um, it has to be deontological in the sense that it has to be, it has to avoid morally um, 
in, in, uh, acts that are uh, intrinsically immoral, such as misrepresentation. And then it has to avoid gratuitous harm. Right? It can't cause us to think in ways that uh, it cause us to embrace in the intrude, in gratuitous harm to other people or, other, or, the, or the members of other species. So, in the, um, so here's a picture of uh, sort of 18th century um, economics. It's uh, very famous or infamous, I think John talked about this um, circular diagram where um, goods and services flow around between firms and households. But uh, what's noticeable about, about this uh, diagram is just like this, di this, this podium here, uh, there's no plug, right? It's not, it's not connected to anything, right? So um, it's sort of a, it's a fantasy view. And, and here, here's a sort of slide from a friend of mine at McGill, Tom Naylor. Um, so the economic worldview of today is, which is what's in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the European Partnership, um, um, is that you know, we have this, uh, we think of the whole world as, as part of the economy. Uh, we, we subordinate the laws uh, and customs of, diff of the different societies on the earth to uh, an economic, uh, an alleged e economic rationality. And then we have little tiny fragments of, um, of the leftovers of, of the natural world, which of course won't work. Um, and so in, in going back to John's talk of yesterday, we uh, at this project um, think of, of the economy as a subset of the biosphere and the, um, and the sociosphere, um, not, the, not the other way around. So it's quite revolutionary uh, from that point of view. And here, here are some of the unrealistic assumptions of, of contemporary um, economics. Um, so the economy, is a, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's not connect, it has neither an input stream nor an output stream to the biophysical systems, the way it's conceptualized. Uh, economic actors obey um, fixed decision rules about maximizing their own utility. This is a little bit adjusted now by behavioral economics, but not much. Uh, the universe obeys the laws of Newtonian mechanics. So the science of so, um, Principia Mathematica was about 1687. There's been no systematic connection between mainstream economic theory and Earth's, Earth system science for 200 years or more. Um, and there are no biophysical limits to the expansion of the market system. Um, and, and expansion always increases human well-being. Um, and I, I put uh, Benjamin Bernanke's name in there just to remind myself of, uh, to talk about his textbook for a minute. He was uh, federal, uh, head of the U.S. Federal Reserve, and he wrote a textbook with two other economists called Macroeconomics. And if you look, it's a 500-page book, if you look up any of the things we've been talking about here, like ocean acidification or species loss or whatever it happens to be, there's either no entry or you're referred to page 30. On page 30, there's a green box, and in the green box, the following two sentences are more or less exactly, I got it exactly right, I think. It, it says, ideally, the economic indicators would assist us in deciding on wise use of natural resources and their depletion. Unfortunately, they do not. Okay, so that's on page 30 of a 500-page book, right? So you think, well, okay, we'll just, we'll just close that and, you know, look around, you know, see if we can find something else. Uh, but, uh, you know, of course, they're pressed on, right? And that's sort of why the, the, this catastrophe with the planetary boundaries uh, is occurring, because macroeconomic policy systematically neglects the characteristics of the system in which it's operating. Uh, wait a minute, go back here for one. Uh, and then it's, and it's foolish to, feel, uh, to interfere with market dynamics. This, of course, is not consistent with Keynesianism and post-Keynesian economics, but it is, um, on the sort of more right-wing features of economics, an important sort of residual notion, and, and I think it comes from, from Christian deism, right? That, that you have to have... <clears throat> so when Newtonian mechanics came along, it created a big problem for Christian theology because it wasn't clear what God could do, right? If, if everything runs like a machine, then what's God's, what's God's work going to be? And so they said, uh, well, God starts the universe, but then he or she just sort of steps back. And so it's already as good as it can be, so the best thing to do is to leave it alone. Um, so this is just uh, ecological economics point of view. Um, so basically we have to think of the Earth as, as open to energy um, and for most part closed to matter, right? So open to energy means we've got this flood of, of free energy that comes in all the time. We, life and other dissipative structures have evolved to, to handle that. 
Um, and then the other sort of basic f feature of it is that it's close to matter, right? That hardly anything ever arrives. It's occasionally a, an unpleasant asteroid or something, a um, little bit of cosmic dust, but nothing ever leaves either, right? Or hardly any little rocket ship every now and again, right? So if you, if you, let's come back to this in a little bit. So if you burn f um, fossil fuel, you create this stream of waste, which stays in one form or another on the planet uh, for a very long time. So I'm not going to go through this. John talked about this um, earlier. But basically, uh, so in terms of thinking about this in worldviews, there's a split here, right? Where if you go down one worldview consistent with big history and evolutionary cosmology, you get one kind of um, economics. If you go down the other worldview, right, the, the, the more ancient worldview and the ones that's, that's really not well reconciled at all with science, you get current uh, macroeconomic policy, which is, uh, as I mentioned, a disaster. Um, and so what we've done in the world, uh, particularly since the 2008 financial crisis, we've more and more turned over the operation of the planet to the high priests of the state-sponsored religion, which is, which is um, <coughs> macroeconomics. And this is um, uh, our, um, Carney, um, Mark Carney from um, Bank of England, used to be head of Bank of Canada, and this is Janet Yellen. Um, who's head of the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve now. These are, um, I'm going to come back to Carney in just a minute, but, but these are the sort of um, architects of um, much, not all, but architects of much of the current catastrophe. Okay, then um, second thing that's happened is, is that there's a um, field of finance has emerged since World War II. Um, and um, it has some of the assumptions of, of this point of view. Um, so m most of all of the ones I've already listed are come, come back um, in one form or another. Economic growth is always good. More money means more wealth. Uh, inflation is the only indicator of too much money. And uh, this can be controlled by the central banks. And the relationship of the quantity of money to the size of the earth is not thought about. So um, when I first started, I'm not really all that interested in finance. I don't balance my own checkbook. Um, and. Um, but I got interested in it because I could see that it maybe was ruining the world I loved. So I got a t finance textbook and I read it and um, I was pretty amazed actually that uh, you couldn't tell where it was located. You know, I mean, there was no mention of it being on the earth. It's some, some sort of thought system that floats out there. Um, no connection to the earth. So um, John Fullerton and I, who's uh, head of Capital Institute in Connecticut, and I decided to call the author of the book, and we, we said, uh, we've noticed that, you're, um, that um, you didn't mention the Earth anywhere. And we were wondered <laughs> whether you could help us in some way, and we're kind of confused here. And so we said, we, don't, we know you're busy. We, all we want you to do is help us think about what the table of contents of your book would look like if it realized that it was on this planet. <laughs> uh, right? And uh, so <laughs> it wasn't quite that rude, but it was close. <laughs> Right. Some reason it seemed to annoy him. I don't know why. <laughs> so um, he said, "No, I'm not. I'm not really interested in helping." So we said, "Well, why is that?" And he said, "Well, I'm interested. I'm, I have a field of inquiry. I don't want to tell you what it was. You might be able to figure out what this was." But he said, "I got a field that I do, and I don't. I just don't care. I'm 68 years old, and I'm just going to keep doing this, and that's that's a ball game." So we said, "Okay. Well, uh, do you know anybody who might be able to help us?" So in 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 his front of his book, there's like hundreds of endorsements. Um, so um, he thought a while and he said, no, I can't think of anybody who could help answer that question. Okay, I said, thank you. So we hung up. A couple of weeks, ago, a couple of weeks after that, I, I was having um, lunch with, um, with a guy who uh, re recently went to, uh, came to Montreal uh, who had an undergraduate degree in physics and was in the finance department at one of the other universities in Montreal. Um, this part story is even richer than I'm telling it, but I can't tell you the, the part I'd really like to tell you without revealing who this is. So um, anyway, I, I gave him the same question. I said, what would finance look like if it was connected to the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology? Uh, he said, well, I thought you, you, I mean, speaking to him, you might be good at this because you actually know some science. And I uh, said, yeah, that's an interesting topic, but if I wrote on that subject, I, my career would be destroyed. So. There we are, we're not making much progress. Okay, so, so the only, the only reason to take away from this is that uh, there's a lot more money around than, that, than there used to be. Money in all its forms, credit card debt, derivatives, mortgages, change in your pocket, you know, and so forth. There's a huge amount more currencies of various kinds than there used to be. Now, one problem with this is, of course, that it mistakes what 
what wealth is, right? Wealth is the ability to do work. Wealth is not the ability, to, it's not the number of little electronic clicks you have in your, uh, in your bank account. Um, and there's some, um, some other issues here that are, that are important uh, that, come, that relate to um, the nature and, qu and quantity of money. So what, one thing that's happened is that there now, there's emerged now a concept called stranded assets. And, and Mark Carney has spoken about this as an important matter. Closer? Is that good? Okay. Um, so a stranded asset is something uh, that somebody thinks they own, but they're not going to ever get to use it. Um, likely the tar sands or portion, portions of the tar sand in Canada are stranded assets because their first place is a worldwide sort of moral rebellion against them. Secondly, the price of oil has fallen so much that it, that's, that's below the, um, the Canadian production costs are way above the, the competitive world price, right? So, so there's several billion dollars, so maybe trillion dollars invested in the tar sands um, that are never going to get realized or are not going to get realized in the intermediate term. Maybe, maybe way down the road something will happen. So uh, John Fullerton, I was talking about a minute ago, sort of said, well, I said, how much money is that? And he said, well, I don't really know, somewhere between 22 and 30 trillion. Uh, that's not just the tar sands. That's global fossil fuel stranded assets. Okay, that's an interesting number. Um, so so one of the things that seems to follow from this is that there's, a, there's more money than there's earth. Um, and that we need to think of, begin to think about the quantity of investment that we want to have. We don't want to just have more investment. We want to make sure that it fits the planet. Um, and then we will also want to have, um, we want to limit the, the kind of investment. It's not everything that somebody will invest in is a good idea. I think you're debating that here in Australia about the new big coal mine. Um, we have to look at what, what the consequences of these investments are going to be. And, and um, I put this uh, word hockey in here to remind myself. Um, so the, um, one of the things that's really remarkable about North American culture is that we have hockey teams in places where it never freezes, right? In San Diego and, and Fort Myers and other, other places. Um, and um, so we don't think about what we're doing, right? Uh, we have, um, then people fly to these games and then if there's gonna be a playoff, the press flies and the fans from Toronto and everybody else, they all fly there and then they all fly back and they bring big bags of junk with them, right, and so forth. So um, it's a very, very um, damaging uh, thing that is just, it seems to have no thought connected to it whatsoever. Um, but in, in the Anthropocene, we have to move from a, so this is the marginalist world, right? This is, everybody makes a little tiny decision at the end of the day, you've got in a situation that's absurd. Um, so what we have to do is move from a, a marginalist um, strategy to a structuralist strategy. And in the Anthropocene, the structures we have to repair are the Earth's life support st systems. That's where our major investment should go. And we also have to take into account as one of the goals of finance, of course, um, the, the justice among humans and justice among other species or with other species. And this, this is a, a very creative idea came from Kate Raworth at uh, Oxfam that says, well, if planetary boundaries are the ceiling of the economic system, then justice is the floor, right? So the economic system has to operate between what the planet can handle and what justice requires. Um, and then I, of course, modified this to put in a question mark of why would it be humanity only that you cared about. But, um, so, um, Okay, so the next problem we've got is we don't, we, our ethical systems don't really fit the problems we've got. Um, so this uh, is going to draw here on some work by Hans Jonas in a book, a very important prescient book called, um, prescient book called um, Imperative of Responsibility, um, which basically made the argument, not that, not that we should abandon traditional ethics, but that traditional ethics didn't really fit the problems that, that we've got uh, here. Uh, so... Um, from so ethical systems in Western culture derived from Judeo-Christian sources, of course, and, and Greek. Um, and in, in the, um, the characteristics of the cultures of that time, the human impact uh, was small and had no, what was seen as insignificant relative to the natural world. And uh, people lived in cities or small communities and, and the, the, they prescribed the limits of the moral community. Um, and the relationship to the natural world was not actually quite true, but it's what Jonas says, was regarded as ethically neutral. And all ethics is either human to human or human to God. 
and proximity in time and space is assumed and no special knowledge is required. So you can see that this isn't going to match up very well with the Anthropocene, right? Because these have almost none, none of the characteristics of this system fit the current system where we have massive, of course, massive global city and so forth. <coughs> we'll come back to ethics um, toward the end here. Um, so, so there's a mismatch between the ethical frameworks and, and what, we've, what we need to think about. And then on, on governance, I also want to make a, a, an argument that there's a mismatch here. Now, this isn't a mismatch that's characteristic necessarily of all teaching about governance in, in the universities, right? There's a lot of enlightened teaching about how we need to change the governmental systems. But I'm talking now about the main framework in which we think about governance, even though it's very well critiqued in, in the academy in, in many cases. Um, so this is a painting um, of the uh, drafting of the Declaration of Independence and the, the very famous uh, sentence written by Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed <clears throat> by their creator with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what I like about this picture a lot is that uh, there's a lot of paper on the floor. Um, and and the, um, the reason I like that is there's a, it shows there were a lot of mistakes, but I, I want to try to show now that a lot of the mistakes uh, got into the document nevertheless. Um, so I'm going to skip over that for now. So, so one of the problems is um, that Jefferson defined the human-Earth relationship as a relationship of property. Um, that's the only relationship, some statutory exceptions to this, but in terms of the constitutional and foundational documents, Klaus can correct me if I'm wrong on this, of the United States, it's only humans and it's only, the only relationship is between, between humans and the earth is, is, is property. Um, now, now the problem here is that this idea rests upon theological arguments that we no longer accept. Um, so, so um, in particular, we no longer, if we take the big history perspective, we no longer uh, have access to the argument that, that the earth is a gift from God to man. Not part of the, that's not part of the narrative. Um, and uh, the whole structure of Locke's argument, which depends on natural law, which I'll, I'll come back to in the question period if anybody wants me to, is not available, uh, at least in the same form. So the notion that the principal human-Earth relationship is one of property has to be one uh, very suspect, and you move, in my view at least, to something much closer to what Klaus, Klaus was talking about. Jeff Jefferson also was criticized, of course, for um, um, having slaves, even though he said all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator, and so forth, and, and also having a, one of his slaves as his mistress. But um, anyway, so, so, the, um, so the three premises that, that Jefferson has um, going here is the sovereign state, the sovereign person, and the natural right of liberty. And I want to show all of these are, are difficult ideas at this point. So um, this is what the world looked like when I was a little kid, you know, uh, go in, I can remember spinning these things around and looking at them and wondering what it would be like to go to those places and things like that. This is what it really looks like, right? The uh, world is a single system, as we've told, been told. Um, so the notion of the sovereign nation state doesn't really fit with reality. Um, and, then, um, and then we had, um, then we, the notion, the second notion is a sovereign person. The person's in charge of his or her own life and controls his or her own body. Well, Michael Gilling laid that to rest yesterday. <laughs> was, uh, you know, I don't need to remind you of parts of his talk, right? It just was there, right? I mean, that we're, we're really uh, bio-embedded and bio-intersected, you know, and they're everywhere, those rascals, right? Um, so, uh, and, then, and then, of course, a lot of what we think doesn't really rise to consciousness anyway. It comes from a, a parts of the brain that we don't, uh, we don't access in a, at the level of consciousness. And then we live in uh, systems of meaning, right? We, we live in vast, vast narratives, and, and um, in, particularly in this electronic age, uh, we seem to be connected to everybody else uh, all the time anyway. Um, and then um, the last one, and I think this is a real, really big bombshell of a problem, is, is the notion of liberty. The reason I chose this slide was I try to maximize nudity in my presentations wherever I can figure it out, right? And uh, so, um, and this is a good one. I like, I like this one, right? Uh, but, you know, it's equal opportunity, nudity. I had frontal male nudity earlier, right? So if you can stand that, I guess you can stand this. Um, right? Um, so, um, so what about the natural right of liberty? So in the, um, you know, to what, to what degree am I free? Well, the standard answer is you can do anything you want to do, provided you don't harm anybody else or his or her property. 
That's from Mel on Liberty around, I don't know, 1850 something. Um, but the problem is in the Anthropocene, when the carbon sink is already full, right, there's no such thing as um, an, an act that doesn't harm someone else. Um, and so I, I kind of revised the Jefferson's notion just a little bit by, by saying that um, in, the, in the Anthropocene, liberty lives in a modest room in the mansion of justice, right? We have to know what our share is. And once we know what our share is, then of course we can do what we want from a moral point of view. But since we don't think about how much our share is, we just blunder ahead. We're, um, we're violating, at least in my, my view, directly violating the golden rule, which um, at least most Anglo-Saxon cultures take as a foundational feature of morality. Um, so, um, the United, in the United States, the, the primary defining feature of political liberalism is freedom. This is not a trivial problem. Okay, so when we uh, burn fossil fuels, we kill other people or species in two ways. Um, what, one is uh, we use up uh, things that could be used for the Hyber-Bosch process to create a low-cost fertilizer. And uh, secondly, we continue to overfill the climate sink. So, um, so there's, a, there's a problem here, uh, a big problem. So now I'm, I just want to talk about higher ed and the Anthropocene and a little bit about finding our way. Um, so first place, I think the prop, going back to what Andrew said in the, at the introduction, the, the, the Anthropocene is not, it seems to me like it's going to be one hell of a rough ride. Um, no matter how you look at it, there, one sea level rise is underway, very small right now, but it will compound. Um, it will, over the next few centuries, uh, possibly even this century, James Hansen thinks there'll be 10 foot sea level rise this century. Um, that's a high prediction, um, but half of that would be, would be a lot. Um, and if you melt all the natural ice on Earth, uh, Tom can correct me if I'm wrong, um, you get around um, 250 feet of sea level rise, is that about right? Yeah, so, so that's where we're headed, right? So if uh, now, it's gonna take a long time to get there and we may never get there because the, the Antarctic ice sheets have been stable for a very long time and they may stay stable, it's quite possible. We don't know that though. But we do know that, that Greenland is going to um, either melt or fall into the ocean or, uh, or slide into the ocean. And we do know the West Antarctic Ice Sheet almost certainly will melt or destabilize over the next couple hundred years. So um, it's gonna be a bad scene. Um, there'll be massive loss of other species. There'll be hundreds of millions of refugees of which the current European crisis looks like a Sunday school picnic. And we've got a lot of institutions that don't work well for the current situation and they don't, so we, we're not sort of well equipped. This is a chart. Uh, John Fullerton and I made and kind of summarize of what, uh, where this talk is going. Um, so, so the basic idea is we have to start with grounding our disciplines, the orphan disciplines, which are kind of around the edge here, the ones I've talked about are finance, economics, law and governance and ethics. We have to, we have to embed the, our understanding of those things in the scientific narrative. Um, and also rest them for, for reasons I'll come back to in a minute on uh, what um, might be regarded as some of the fundamental religious truths of mankind. Um, so uh, anyway, if, if we, um, let's just summarize what I just said, we would have a, a, then an integrated, a reconciled body of teaching in universities, right? So, so we wouldn't have the sciences over here and the arts and the, and the humanities and the social sciences and the professions over here, right? It would all be just like this, transparent and one thing. Um, this, is, this is how we think about uh, the economy nowadays. We already know that. This is how we need to think about it. Um, so, so we need to get um, back to, we need to embed these systems in, bio, in how we understand the universe actually works. And so, so what to do? Um, well, one way to get the attention of economists is to stop giving them money. Um, and so, so that's one thing I think we should do. I, I think if, if you are donate to a university and the university teaches economics that says it's okay to destroy the Earth's life support systems, cut them off, right? What, what's the point of giving money to organizations which make it more difficult for life to survive and what's already going to be a bad scene? Um, so I, I, must, I must admit I have a bit of an of a, of a edge on you guys on this kind of thing because being a Quaker 
And I come from a long tradition of, of sort of stiff-necked and sometimes regarded as uh, obnoxious behavior, right? Uh, but, um, you know, go thou and do likewise, right? I mean, why not, why support these things that are basically ruining the prospects of the future? Um, so, uh, and I would apply this to the other, other disciplines as well um, for reasons I've just given. But, but sort of the basic message here is be a university, right? Be, study the universe and then fit the thought systems to how the universe works, which is not for reasons I've talked about what we do. So, um, this is Waterhouse, a great uh, painting. Um, so Narcissus is, is a nice looking woman sitting here. And um, Narcissus is taken with his own image, right? And basically um, dies because he's so self-infatuated. So what we do in the disciplines I've been listing is we don't study the universe. We study our own thinking about the universe. And then we mistake the thinking for the reality, right? So we're, we're self-infatuated in that way. Uh, okay, now finding our way in the Anthropocene. I just want to talk quickly about this. Um, so I tried to figure out if you, so I said I, that sparse toolbox. So I want to figure out what ethics would look like if I couldn't use any of the Judeo-Christian premises that were located in the sparse toolbox slide. Remember, no exogenous rescue, so forth and so on, right? So this is what I came up with. Um, membership, that we're members of, of living and non-living communities and we owe those communities respect. Uh, sec second is that uh, to show respect, we have to keep the household clean. We have to keep life's kitchen clean, right? So that life can clean. Clean can be, the expansion of clean, of course, due to Michael's talk yesterday, can be expanded considerably, right? But, but we don't want to have, uh, you know, we, we should create things which, in which allows life to flourish. And then the last one, sort of, sort of a different version of the same point is, we should protect the things that make far from equilibrium systems, such as our, ourselves, possible into the, indefinitely into the future. Um, and then I just want to say a little bit about um, how religion fits into this. So I, I've done a lot of teaching at McGill with some colleagues in the Faculty of Science, <clears throat> and I always like to bring up religion one way or another in the class, and they always think, oh, it's a bunch of junk, you know, and it causes all kinds of conflict, and forget it, and it's not scientific, and who knows? Well, I think that's unscientific because hey, religion is a fact. There may be no God or there may be a God, but people have religious experiences. So that should be, under, that's understandable, maybe, through science. Um, and so there's been, been some work on, on this, uh, trying to figure out how religious experience is enabled because large numbers of people have it. And um, so, so there is, um, Research is controversial. Some people hate it. Some people love it. Um, but but it seems that that a certain religious experience is is enabled biologically by a change in brain state and state brain function. Um, and that go back to William James and the early empirical study of religion. Many versions of this experience have this notion of peace and wholeness uh, with, with the universe. Um, and a um, and so. Um, you have to look at the question of why would religious experience be selected for in, in a biological um, narrative. And there are two different answers to that question. One, one uh, from a book that John Erickson gave me, um, Sir Lent me, said that um, um, religious experience is kind of a, like an appendix, right? It's, it's, it's something that always goes wrong when you're on a camping trip. Right, and, and so you don't, really don't want to have it, right? It's kind of a mistake. It would have been, would have been better if it had never shown up, right? And then there's an, another argument that it's selected for because it, it, it improves group, group cohesion, right? So if you have um, you know, a, a powerful religious leader like Moses or Jesus or Muhammad, your group often will succeed competitively against other groups, right? So if you look at the Ten Commandments that way, that's a pretty select, you know, and, and the dominance of Western culture over, over substantial portions of the earth, from an evolutionary biology point of view, that's a pretty good set of rules. Um, so, um, I just think this is um, sort of where, where, where it comes out if, if you're taking a big history narrative. Um, that, that the goal of, of um, um, so what, what is citizenship in the, uh, in the framework I'm talking about? Um, 
I took this, uh, these ideas from a book by James Karsk called Finite and Infinite Games. And um, the basic distinction is very simple. There are finite games like <clears throat> rugby and basketball and things like that. The point of the game is to win. It's played in a given place. There's a set of rules, a limited number of players, a certain time, and so forth. Um, and uh, the point of the game is to win. But then there's another set of games called infinite games in which the players can change, the rules can change, the place can change. And the, game, the objective of the game is to keep the game going. And my, my interpretation of citizenship, if you're looking at the world the way I'm looking at it, is that we're finite players in an infinite game. And the infinite game is the game of evolution, right? Cultural evolution, biological evolution. And the challenge of the Anthropocene is to keep the game going. So I'm just, this, I'll end with this quote from Einstein. Thanks very much. Thank you. modify that to say there's a, there's a remote possibility of exogenous <laughs> rescue. <laughs> and then I'll put a footnote to you. <laughs> right. You know, for long distance space travel, it, where you're going to have reproduction, a man and a woman have to stay in, in, a, in a small space for a long time together. I've been divorced twice. You know? <laughs> right. Although they both stay young and beautiful and handsome for the whole trip, I guess, if they get up near the speed of light. birth rate, I mean, independent of, of the sort of human rights considerations, which are, of course, very important. There's also the, the sort of collective problem of, of, a very high, of very high birth rates, which is an enormous problem. Um, and the, the, um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that you can get substantial reductions in birth rates by, by education of women and by you know, family planning and gender education or whatever you want to call it. I, I don't think that's, I mean, I think it's very important to think of that as education of men and women, uh, otherwise, otherwise you get this sort of a split society where there's a lot of competence in one gender and not much in the other, and that, that's a recipe for disaster. I think this is maybe a longer conversation than we should, we should have now, but, but um, th yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's essential for intrinsic and, and exogenous reasons to um, do what you're suggesting. Well, it depends on how you define religion. I mean, I'm, I've, I'm very taken with George Santayana's uh, definition of religion, which is respect for the sources of our being. Um, that, that is consistent with, um, well, it's consistent with the, with the quote I've got up here. Also consistent with, I think, almost all of, of religions in the world. Um, I, I think re religion to have transcendent elements for reasons that Klaus mentioned, that I've mentioned, I, I think are, are um, the wrong way to go. Um, so I, I think there, sh I mean, my, my view is there should be a civic religion of respect for the earth um, for all, by all persons. Um, some people don't like the world re word religion at all because right, it has connotations of the crusades and other disasters that have been carried on in the name of religion. So I don't know, it's a fact. Um, you can't get rid of it. It's, can you turn it in a good direction? I hope so. I don't think you can, uh, maybe it's a little bit of David's not going to like this, David, um, here, but, but um, the current economic system operates on neoclassical assumptions. Um, there are ways within that to make minor course corrections, like through carbon taxes and other things like that. So, I mean, within that framework, that's what I would do. But I, I think if you're an articulate person, um, I, I would, first place, I, I would go on to, I would come to E4A, right, and, and then, you know, we can t talk to you about ecological economics. <laughs> um, and, um, but, but I, I think the tool, you, you, you can't get there from here, basically, in a way, right? You, you, got, you can't work, do what's needed to reduce the impact of the Anthropocene or to turn another way. You, use, keep, you keep the neoclassical model. And I would just, I hope that since you're articulate and well-educated in the model, I, I would be its demise. Very much. Okay, well, thanks for having me.